the Lord for it. Praise God. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, everyone knows that small changes really make for big rewards, right? Over a consistent time. And so Brian Olson of Schwab Center of Investment Research said that just by making a few small changes in your life, you can really make a big difference in your savings in retirement. And the center released results of a study that showed giving up potato chips with lunch could save you $176.80 a year. Now, I think that might have been before uh, these new changes, but... And, <laughs> So it's even more. It's even more. Okay. And, and so in generate retirement savings, it would generate retirement savings of $10,483.62 in 20 years at a 10% return. So the same principles was illustrated with the number of common indulgences. So let's look at this. So we got cookies waiting downstairs, but this is two donuts. If you give up two donuts a week, that's a lot of donuts during the week, right? Well, but we just ate all those pooch keys, right? So if you give up two donuts a week, it could boost your nest egg to $6,552.26 in just 20 years, all right? If you switch from double latte with whipped cream to regular coffee, you could save $429 per year, which is a whopping $27,028.07 at a 10% rate over 20 years. Wow. So Olson released these facts to underscore one of the oldest investment maxims. That is, regular investments, even in small amounts, will make a big difference in savings and retirement. So all the positive steps you take, even the small ones, make a significant difference over time. Right? Well, let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you that you've, you've created compound interest, Lord, not only with finances, but also in relationships. Lord, so we bind the enemy in what he wants to do, not only with our finances, but also in our relationships. And we cast him down in the name of Jesus. And we loosen your power in our lives, your wisdom, your understanding, Lord, to go forth, Lord, and to do exactly what you want us to do in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So invest. We want to invest. Now, I want to share with you about relationship investment. And the whole series is on relationships. You got to get real. The real you determines the health of your relationships. That's what it comes down to. So I got a test for you today for you to examine yourself and to test if you have healthy relationships. Here's the first question. Are you prepared for healthy relationships? That's the first question. Are you prepared for healthy relationships? The second one is, are you willing to connect by focusing on others? And then the third one, and we're going to hold on the third one for right now, but are you willing to build mutual trust? Mutual trust. So if you've answered yes to the first three questions, then you're more than likely uh, to have most of your relationships be healthy. Most of your relationships will be healthy if you answered yes to the first three. The, the first one, you, you're emotionally prepared for relationships because you let go of personal baggage. You know, there was a, a, a word this morning, consider, you know, kind of had that in there. You know, you just got to let go of some stuff. So you are emotionally prepared for relationships because you've let go of personal baggage. The second thing is, is you're able to connect well with others. That's a big one. And the third one is, if you said yes, then you're able to build trust with people that are around you. But if you were to stop right there and you've gotten 100% on those first three before you, and not answer the fourth one, you'd only get 75% on this test, right? Three out of four. This brings us to the last question. Are you willing to invest in others? Why is this question the difference between an A 
and a C. Why is it? Well, let me just explain it this way. You can build, relation, you can build uh, your dream home. You can build your dream home, but eventually you're going to have to remodel it, right? You're going to have a successful career, but eventually you're going to retire. One way or another, you're going to retire, <laughs> right? Now, you may have accumulated a great amount of wealth, but you can't take it with you. You may be in superb health today, but eventually you're going to die. You may have achieved great accomplishments, but someone will accomplish more. Now, many people invest in all these things, but all these things are just temporary. There's something that's not, though. There's something that you can invest that will last, and that's when you invest in people. Amen. That's going to be lasting investment. So I want to share with you today from Numbers 27, 18 through 23, and this is dealing with Moses. And Moses really had a, a heart to invest in others. I mean, he came back to be the deliverer of God's people, right? And, and you know, the Lord delivered them, but he, brought, he, he came back and let the Lord work through him. And with the plagues and everything else, Pharaoh released the people and Moses led them out of slavery and into where God wanted them to go, right? And so he, he's a big investor in the people. He invested in people, and there was, you know, there could have been a few million people that left that Moses was investing in. Now, now we're going to look at that's the mic, that, that's the macro, but now we're going to look right into the micro and look a little closer. In Numbers 27, 18 through 23, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man whom is the spirit is the spirit. It, Man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eliza the priest and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him with some of your authority, that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. And he shall stand before Eliza the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word, they shall go out, and at his word, they shall come in, both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. Right there we see Moses is making an individual investment into Joshua right here, right? And it's not just an easy one because he's actually giving up some of his authority, which a lot of people have a hard time with. And so this is, this is the young man who God has picked out of the people to be the next leader of Israel. And it always starts with a little bit of authority given. And it's done in front of the whole congregation. Now, relationships are a lot like any other investment. Your return is determined by how much you invest, right? Right? Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 says it this way. Invest what you have because after a while you will get a return. After a while. Maybe not right away, but after a while you'll get a return. Now, if you're not getting a return, maybe it's because you're not really investing a whole lot. Or maybe you haven't waited long enough. So, how do we hinder ourselves from investing in others? How do we stop ourselves from doing that? Well, the first thing is we don't look for common ground. I think that's the first thing you got to do is you got to look for common ground in people. 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, Yes, whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. That's the whole purpose with finding common ground. So if you're always looking at others, if they're the problem, you're never going to find common ground, right? right? If you're looking at people like that all the time, then they're not the problem. You're the problem. You know, it just reminds me, when I see an alcoholic, I see someone I can find common ground with. 
not because I, I'm an alcoholic with them, but because I know the hurt of what that feels like to live that way. So I can find common ground. We can all find common ground with things like food and sports. That's easy. You can find, I mean, just sit at the table and eat with somebody, you're finding common ground right there, right? That's just a you know, beginner, that's a starter. But don't overlook the common ground of failure. With failure, there's a lot of common ground. We've all failed, and we all know what it feels like to fail, right? We all do. So what I've discovered is if you want to influence people, share some of your failures. Everybody has failed, so it's a great way to connect. Just don't forget to encourage them to live above their failures, though. All right? Don't stay there in your failure or in the past failure. Tell them how you got out of that or how you're not failing as much as you used to and what's helped you. So don't let yourself uh, look at people in a way to where you just see their mistakes. Look at them in a way to what you know, the Bible says. We've all fallen short of the God's glorious standard, right? But look at them in a way to where God can use you to help them out of their failure. Here's another one that uh, really hinders us from investing in others. We struggle with demonstrating patience, right? Everyone struggles. <laughs> We're a church, right? So who, who, who struggles at times with patience? Yeah? Okay, well, half of you are here are, are ready for sainthood right now. So <laughs> Proverbs 25, 15 says, Patience and gentle talk can conceive a ruler and overcome any problem. Overcome any problem. You know, patience is like a weapon that God has given us. It's like a weapon. We can use it to overcome any problem. It takes time to develop good relationships, doesn't it? It takes some time. Patience develops faster, though, when we realize that people have and create problems. When we realize that, that people have problems and they create problems, then patience is going to develop a whole lot faster in our lives. Everyone has problems, right? Everyone has blind spots, has flaws, including me. Right? I can get impatient with the smallest of things at times. I can, I can do super well at, 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 at things, and then all of a sudden it creeps up on me. I can get impatient with the smallest of things. Ernest and I were working next door at the new building uh, in these past few weeks, and uh, we're just trying to get a lot of work done and everything else. And, and uh, I caught myself getting impatient. I caught myself getting impatient with Ernest because... I didn't think Ernest was cutting the wood fast enough. And so I found myself getting impatient, and I knew in my heart that was wrong. And so I just had to get past that. So Ernest, I know you're watching, so I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> I'm going to try to be more patient. But we all get impatient, don't we? At one time or another. So try to give others the same kind of grace that you would want for your shortcomings, right? And here's the last thing that can hinder us with investing people is we compare ourselves with others. This is a big one. Galatians 6, 4 through 5 says this, make a careful exploration of who you are and work and the work you have been given and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing create your creative best, the creative best you can with your own life. So we're all responsible for ourselves to do our creative best with our own lives, right? We can, we can hinder ourselves with investing in others by comparing ourselves with other people. And there's, uh, there's each spectrum of that, right? There's, uh, man, they're so good, I'm never going to be, you know, and all this stuff. And then it's like, man, I'm a lot better than them. You know, and that's the other side. 
So don't compare yourself with others. Those who are always comparing themselves to others find themselves wanting. You know that? You'll find yourself wanting if you do that. It's hard for them to get beyond themselves. I heard a little earlier this morning, it's not about you. It's not about you, including feeling comfortable in your own skin. You know, you got to get over yourself. And sometimes you just got to feel comfortable in your own skin to be able to do that and realize, you know, you're going to make a mistake. You're, but with every mistake you make, you're go, it's going to be an opportunity to actually improve and get better. That's right. And so don't look at mistakes and failure as, as a, a lack of success. Look at it as a stepping stone to success. Amen. Amen? And for other people too. So, with all that being said, are you willing to invest in others? That's the question. Are you willing to invest in others? If you are, say yes. yes. All right. Well, here's, I got three, three different points about so, the best way to really invest in others. And these are just three general points. And the first one is cultivate the good. Cultivate the good in the relationship. 1 Peter 3.11 says, Snub evil and cultivate good. Run after peace for all your worth. Man. Cultivation happens after the seed has been planted and it's already sprouted. That's when cultivation happens. And the reason why is because the weeds start coming up at that time, Right? So cultivation is to remove the weeds that grow up in order to nurture the plant, right? So when you plant the seed of a relationship, you're going to have to cultivate that. You're going to have to nurture it. It also means that you, you have to break up the hard ground so the earth can breathe and that, and that plant can grow better, healthier, Right? It's the same thing in a relationship. you got to break up that hard ground. Sometimes there's a lot of hard ground, hard like clay. Freeland sand, we call it here. There's some hard, hard clay in Freeland. There's also some hard, hard clay uh, that could represent people's hearts, at least at first. But that's why you got to cultivate the good. Now, all relationships need cultivation to grow. But not all relationships need the same amount of time and attention. All right? Don't, don't think you've got to spend the same amount of time and attention, attention with each, each of your different relationships. No. Work relationships, not as much attention is compared to like a marriage relationship, right? So not all relationships are equal in that way. You only have so much time. But you need to cultivate the good in each relationship. And so be wise about that. There's basically three types of relationships. I want to try to compare them to, to farming and planting and gardening. And the first one, the first kind of relationship, blooms for just a very short time. You know, those flowers that you spend all that time planting. And then they come up and they bloom for that three days during the spring or in the summer, and then they're gone, right? Well, relationships can be like that. There's some relationships like that, and that's okay. These are very short and, and might occur for very specific reasons. Sometimes they come, and then they're, they go away forever. Other times they're ongoing, but occasional. Like, for instance, once every year, when, when uh, April 15th starts drawing near, when we start getting closer to April 15th, I have a relationship that I have to touch base with. I have to cultivate the good in it a little bit, and that's with my CPA, Mark, my guy, the guy that does my taxes. And I'll, I'll call him and talk to him maybe a couple times before April 15th comes. And so that's just one of those types of relationships that, that blooms just for a very short amount of time and then goes away. Sometimes comes back every year, but sometimes can be gone forever. Now, <clears throat> these relationships need only brief, periodic cultivation. Okay? So they're not like 
all your other relationships. Here's the second type of relationship. The, it's, it, they're more like annuals, and they only last for a season. So there's, there's these relationships that may last only a few weeks or a few years. But just because they are for a season doesn't mean they're not important. Cultivate the relationship according to the season. And so relationships with our children's teachers or coaches. If you ever had uh, uh, kids that are being coached uh, or in seasonal sports, you know that's the kind of relationship I'm talking about. There's, you, you have to cultivate the good in those relationships. And you may see them for volleyball or bowling season, just for a short amount of time, and, and maybe not again till the next year, and maybe not again ever. But usually, those kind of relationships, they're going to be, they're going to last for a season. Now, the last one is more like planting an oak tree. When you plant an oak, you're, you're thinking long-term, right? It's a long-term type of relationship, a kind of relationship that is constant and long-lasting. And these are few and far between, but very exceptional. But if we want these relationships to stay healthy and grow, we must not neglect to cultivate the good in them also. So you cannot neglect a relationship and expect it to grow. That's what I'm getting at. Every relationship, you're going to have to cultivate it if you want it to grow and to be healthy. But don't, you know, it, it's a time-sensitive thing. They're not all the same. And so you just, you, you can't just cultivate the bad in a relationship. I want to make sure I say that. Is sometimes we, we cultivate the bad in, in a relationship. That's all we can see, and that's all we focus on, and that's it. But the word says cultivate the good. Snub the bad, snub the evil, but cultivate the good, right? Doesn't mean accept the evil or the bad. It's saying cultivate the good. Cultivate the good. And your relationships will be healthy. Amen? Here's the second, here's the second thing that you can do to invest in others. And that is communicate at all times. And there's an interesting passage here in the Bible, in Numbers chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, and I just want to give you a little backdrop here. The Lord is uh, moving. He's, he's, he's leading his people in you know, they, a cloud by day and a fire at night and the whole thing. And he's hearing and he sees what all the people are doing. He knows what's going on, just like today. And so he sees something happening. And actually, the word says he heard it. He heard a conversation take place. And that conversation was between Aaron and Miriam. And it was a, a very critical conversation about Moses. And the reason why it was kind of brought up was Moses married an Ethiopian woman. But but the criticism wasn't all about that in particular. It was really criticizing his leadership and about how he hears God and how they hear God. And so they were being critical of Moses just using a situation of him marrying an Ethiopian woman. And it says that the Lord heard what they had said. Man. It kind of gives you a little chill right there, right? The Lord hears things that go on and things that are said. And here's how the Lord responds to it. It says, Then the Lord descended in the cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam step forward, he commanded, and they did. And the Lord said to them, even with a prophet, I would communicate by visions and dreams. But that is not how I communicate with my servant Moses. He is completely at home in my house. With him, I speak face to face. And he shall see the very form of God. Why then were you not afraid to criticize him? <laughs> now, can you imagine the Lord... <laughs> The Lord descends down in a cloud 
it, right in front of the, the tabernacle. And there's Moses, there's Aaron, and there's Miriam, and they're standing there. And he says, step out, Miriam and, and Aaron. Now, could you imagine that? You, you show up uh, to, a, to a meeting, and, and someone, the leader says, all right, you two step forward. I want to deal with this. And so the Lord deals with this. And what we find out here is communication breaks, breaks down by talking behind someone else's back or gossiping. Do you realize that? Communication breaks down. That's a great way to break down communication is to talk behind someone's back, criticizing them or gossiping about them. So Aaron and Miriam had done just that thing because they didn't like Moses and his choice and Mary and the Ethiopian woman. That's what brought it all up. But there was more behind it. And this led them to even questioning Moses' leadership. Now God opened up the communication between all three. He called all three there, and he showed up. And by descending in the cloud and standing before them, calling Aaron and Miriam to step forward and let them know very clearly how he communicates. Now, there's a lesson in that right there. Real communication happens face-to-face, right? And so not by criticizing someone behind their back. That's not real communication. That actually breaks down communication. So do you think there was a next time when the Lord had to talk to Aaron and Miriam about inappropriate communication? Do you think there was a next time? We don't find it next time, do we? So it's dealt with right there. It's, it, it's really amazing what the Lord did. And so how can a relationship grow healthy without good communication? How can it? It can't, right? It often begins with easy communication. Just things to talk about. You just got to uh, talk to someone, right? Sometimes a spark easily, easily ignites a friendship. You ever notice that? There's some times where you could just, something happens and you just talk, hey, you know, this person's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I might, I might invite this person to go have an ice cream social, you know, or whatever. Uh, and so sometimes that happens and it deepens with more difficult communication, though. Difficult communication doesn't hinder a relationship, it actually deepens it. When I say difficult communication is when there's a disagreement. And if you make up your mind and you determine in your mind, in your heart, that your relationship with that person is more important than the situation, you're going to go into that disagreement and come out of that a whole lot better than if you think a different way. So difficult communication is a time when there might be a disagreement. Uh, The author Sidney J. Harris said, It is impossible to learn anything important about anyone until we get him or her to disagree with us. It is only in contradiction that character is disclosed. Now that's that's some pretty good wisdom right there, right? So communication at all times is what I'm saying. At all times. Now make sure that you don't go in with it's all about you attitude communication and make sure you go in led by the Holy Spirit. But it's okay to disagree at times. Uh, it's not okay to come out of uh, the, the relationship with a disagreement that ends it. You know, that it just totally trashes it and that's it. Uh, even with a disagreement, you can still be friends with someone and leave it at that, Right? You can still have, you don't even have to be friends to have a healthy relationship, right? Right. You can have healthy relationships with people that are, you just know them, you know who they are. You can be walking through the store, hey Bob, how's it going? You don't really, other than that, you don't really know Bob's life, or you don't know what he's going through or anything like that. But that's a healthy communication, right? You recognize Bob, that's okay, and you, you keep moving on. You and Bob both have something to do, and it's not with each other. That's okay. Right? So, communication at all times. So, when you agree or when you disagree, communication at all times. 
Face-to-face -face communications help us to grow in our relationships. And sustaining healthy relationships during times of disagreement is done through intentional communication. You've got to be intentional about it. And remember that people communicate on different levels. All right? The Lord communicates with prophets through dreams and visions. With certain people, like Moses, it was on a much deeper level. Right? Now think about that. The Lord's letting us know there's different levels with him. And there's different levels in our relationships with others. Now, after a few years into our marriage, I realized that old saying or old stat, whatever you want to call it, that a man uses 10,000 words a day and in a woman, I think it was 40,000, right? 40,000 words a day. There's quite a bit of difference there. That's a large gap. So it takes me four days to catch up to my wife, right? So now I, f I discovered that that was true, basically. I mean, I, I don't count the words, but the generalization is true. And I would get home from work having used up most of my 10,000 words, only to discover that my wife is, is on, you know, word 25,001, and she had 15,000 more to go. And I realized that I wasn't as very enthusiastic as I should have been in our conversations early on in our marriage because my speech odometer hit 10,001 words, right? You just kind of, guys, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm working with you here. Amen? So, but that wasn't fair to my wife, let alone it wasn't right. Amen. <laughs> okay, women, that's your turn. You can say amen. Yeah. That was my wife, by the way. Uh, so I had to make an adjustment. I would start every day by spending part of my first 10,000 words by saying something to her, talking to her, letting her, her, I know, uh, letting her know that I love you. And, and even today that we can't, we got this agreement that we just don't leave the house or leave each other without giving each other a kiss and saying, I love you. And so that's part of my 10,000 words. And I think that's a great part. And so I had to make that adjustment. So then no matter, uh, no matter what, I would make sure that to, to have enough words reserved in my word tank, okay? It's just like those uh, old trucks, you know, big, big F-350, you know, you got, you got two fuel tanks. You got the 30-gallon the over here. You got the 30-gallon over here. You got, you got 30 gallons on reserve. So I was like that. I said, I'm, I'm going to be like that truck. I'm going to have a lot more words in reserve in my word tank for my wife. No matter if, no matter if this tank is empty or not, I'm going to make sure I, I switch the, you know, do the toggle switch and it goes over to the next tank. Even if I had to get into the next day, right? And so I just made that switch. And even when I felt like I was running low, what I would do is I would, there's a lot of different ways to communicate with people outside of words, right? Now, I don't know sign language, but I do have facial expressions. Like, oh, that's pretty interesting. Wow. I never knew that, you know, or, you know, just the expression itself. Whoa. Yeah. My God, yeah. You know, and, and so I would do whatever it takes to, to, get, to get that and, and just be able to focus on her and that communication with her. So what am I saying? There's always a way to communicate. Communicate at all times. In agreement and disagreement. In good times and bad times. In times when you have words, and in times when you don't have so many words. Sometimes the best way to communicate with someone is just being there with them. Right? So, cultivate the good, communicate at all times. And here's the last one. I think, I think this one is really important. And we're going we're gonna to do this more and more, uh, just as a church this year, but... We're, you need to celebrate others when they succeed. Amen. Proverbs 28.12 says, 
when an honest person wins, it's time to celebrate. Amen. You know, we're not celebrating bad things, okay? We're, when an honest person wins, yes. it's time to celebrate. Okay. Right? So, have you ever noticed that when you fail, many people will sympathize with you, they'll come to you and, and, and console you, they'll be there and all that, and that's fine and everything. But when you succeed, few are ready to celebrate with you. You ever notice that? There's something wrong with that. Average people don't like it when you go above average. That's really what it comes down to. And if you don't want to be an average person, then you're going to have to learn how to celebrate others when they succeed. So we're not average, right? Right? We're particular people. We're a holy people. We're, we're, we're a holy nation, right? We're royalty. We're not just average people. We're, we're the head and not the tail. We're far above that. So frequently, the very same qualities that prevent people from achieving success, uh, which is things like emotional insecurity, a mindset of lack, maybe even jealousy and so on, those things, Keep them from celebrating the success of others. Right. That's what it, it, that baggage thing. Yeah. And so you got to let go of that baggage. The joy of an accomplishment is not as great when no one celebrates with you. You notice that? Uh, hey, accomplishments need celebration. Right. They need a celebration. That's why last year we celebrated uh, two different people that retired. That's an accomplishment. Hey, you made it, you know. Number one, you made it. But number two, you worked a long time at these different places. You need, you need a, you deserve it. We need to celebrate, right? Yeah. So that's what, that's what we got to do. We got to celebrate. Now, some of us went to a church conference uh, in Midland a, uh, a couple years ago. And I knew I'd be seeing other pastors and leaders at this conference. So I was kind of excited because we had, we had this building project and everything else. And one thing that happens when you go to a, a conference and you see different leaders is you, you all ask each other, you know, hey, what's new? What's new in your life? What's going on at the church? You know, all this stuff. So what I did is I brought my tab with me. I brought my tab, which I had my PowerPoint uh, on there with a whole bunch of different pictures of uh, the building, the construction, everything going on, because I was ready, I was prepared to show them, hey, here's what's new right here. And so this one, uh, this one leader uh, came up, and, he, and he, he was, I was all excited to see him because he was a very, he's a very successful pastor uh, of, a, of a big church, and he asked me, hey, what's new? And so without hesitation, I whipped out my tab. Well, I'll show you. I'll show you what's new. And I pulled up my PowerPoint presentation, which is just a bunch of pictures. And I started showing them. I went through it with them and stuff. And, and maybe I was a little too excited about it. Uh, but I thought I contained it a little bit. And I was showing, yeah, this is what's going on. This is, you know, this is our people working here. And this is what we did. Blah, blah, blah. And so I got done showing them the pictures. And this is all done in, within five minutes, okay? I'm, I'm not there for... for an hour or anything. And so he just, he just looked at me and said something like this. And he said, well, you do know that the average pastor who starts a building project only lasts for about two years after that building project is, is done. And it took me by surprise. I kind of thought, wow, wow. Like, I didn't know that already. I, I know that stat, okay? It is in my mind. But that was the only thing he said to me. Yeah. And then walked yeah. away. And it was like, man, that just gave a sour taste in my mind. It was like, he just crushed my excitement, you know? It was just like, well, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm not going to let some, you know, what someone says to me ruin my excitement or anything. Right. And I already know that stat. 
And it's like, you know what? Sure, that stat exists, but I'm not going to allow that to crush my enthusiasm, my excitement, and the success we've had as a church and what God is doing. So I made a determination to celebrate with others when they succeed. I, I made... I was more determined than ever to do that. So when that happened, I just said to myself and in my heart, Lord, I never want to be like that. I want to, I want to always be the person who celebrates someone else's success no matter what. Amen. Right? That's the people we want to be. Yes. Now, <clears throat> a great way to encourage people is to celebrate their accomplishments. That's, right. That's a great way. And who knows what they can accomplish when they know others want them to succeed, right? When you have uh, somebody maybe who's in a position where they're successful and everything else, and they, they talk with you and they, and they look at you and they t- look at you right in the eyes and say, you know what, I'm really happy for you. That is awesome. I can't believe what the Lord is doing so quickly in your life and, and, and what's happening and all that. And let's, can we celebrate or do something like that? You know, you're going to keep on succeeding. You're, I, I just sense that you're going to keep moving forward and this is just going to be the first step of your success. Imagine what you'd feel like. Like, man, I, you know, I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm moving forward. So yesterday was Bill Day. And it was a success. It was really good. Uh, Much of the concrete dust was cleaned up in the new building. And I've been coughing on that and choking on that for a couple years now. And it's like a lot of that got cleaned up, you know, just mopped up, wiped up, all that stuff. And there's a lot less concrete dust in that building than there was on Friday. And we were able to install a lot of foam board in the exterior walls, especially in the front of the building. So praise God, that got accomplished. And we had an awesome lunch. It was a good lunch. We had a good lunch and had a good time. So I just want to let you know, if you're a part of the build team yesterday, whether you prepared food or you were there working, if you were part of that, would you stand up? We want to celebrate you today. So go ahead, stand up. Don't be, yeah, there you go. Praise God. All right, so there's some people that didn't stand up. We, we know your false humility, so. <laughs> but we'll ce- we celebrate that. Yeah. That's so good, you know. It's, it's awesome, and we're going to celebrate that. We had success yesterday yeah. as a church because of you and because of, of people who generously give. We, we're having success. And the Lord is moving us forward, and we're doing. We're moving forward, and we're going to continue to succeed. Now, <clears throat> We must all realize to accomplish our goals, we're going to need the help of others. Unless you have really small goals, you can do them by yourself, okay? But if you you have big goals and big dreams, you're always going to need other people in your life to accomplish those goals and dreams. So remember that. Remember that. And always use that is a reason to invest in others. You know, and it might seem selfish at first, but I'm going to tell you, after you get doing it, you're going to realize that it's just like the Lord said, it's better to give than receive, and it's going to bless you even more and more and more as you go. Now, you're going to realize that that's the case. And besides, it's a lot of fun to, to help others succeed. It's a lot of fun to help others succeed. I mean, it is fun. The more people you encourage and help succeed, the more you're going to celebrate. Right. Now, think about that. Yeah, I like to celebrate. You know, I just think of that song, celebrate good times, come on, you know. And so whenever someone uh, succeeds, I just, I hear that song playing. That's like, yeah, Lord, we're going to celebrate that. And so... <clears throat> I encourage you to celebrate others when they succeed. Now, one of the truest tests of a healthy relationship isn't just 
how well you sympathize with your friends when they fail. But don't get caught there, okay? That's good to do that. But how excited you are for them when they succeed. Amen. That's the real test. That's the real test of, of a healthy relationship, a healthy friendship. So the real you determines the health of your relationships. So who do you want to be? Who's the real you or who do you really want to be more of? More of the Lord or more of yourself? You know? So I just encourage you to invest in others. You know, if we, if we want to be all that God wants us to be, all that how God made us to be and, and uh, wants us to be, fulfill our purpose in a, in a 100% way, then we must be able to, we must invest in others. There's no way you can be all that God wants you to be without investing in others. I mean, that's part of the Great Commission. Make disciples. You know, tell them about Jesus. Get them connected to the church. Make disciples. Make, them, make those disciples disciple makers. So it's what the Great Commission is all about. It's what Jesus himself did for everyone who's ever lived in the past or will live in the future. He invested everything he had, his life, dying on the cross to pay the price of our sin to help us succeed and have the victory, right? By giving his life. Giving his life so we can have life and life more abundant, right? So let's stand. If you want to receive the benefits of the Lord Jesus' investment, then say yes. Yes. Yeah, I do, I do. If you're watching online, if you want to receive those benefits of the Lord Jesus' investments, then you've got to say yes to them. And if you haven't said yes, then you're not going to receive very much. So I encourage you to start there. Start with your relationship with the Lord. And it's really easy. Yeah, go to him and say, you know, I failed, I messed up. I want to have a relationship with you. And what that looks like is repent of your sins. And, and make him the Lord of your life. Recognize him for who he is. He's the son of God. He is, he is Jesus, the Messiah, who paid the price for your mistakes. He's covered that over, atoned that with his blood, and he was raised from the dead. So you will have the victory. It's as simple as that. So if you want a healthy relationship, it all starts with Jesus first. How is that relationship with him going? So with heads bowed and eyes closed, let's just make sure that we give people an opportunity. Lord, Lord, whoever may be watching online or whoever's here that needs to improve their relationship with you, I pray in your mighty name, Jesus, that uh, we would just make that right. Whatever there is, is in between uh, us and you, Lord, ourselves and you, Lord, if it's a sin, if it's an unconfessed sin, whatever that may be, Lord, that we just take care of that right now before you. And Lord, we get that out of the way so we can have open communication with you. Lord, we love you. We care for you. We love you, Lord. We thank you that because you loved us, we can, we can love you back. So Lord, we thank you and we believe in all of our hearts, Lord, that, that you are the Son of God who was raised from the dead, who paid the price for our sin, and who wants us to succeed in every way. And Lord, we want to have a healthy relationship with you and with others, and we want to encourage other people. We want to celebrate with them. We want to cultivate the good and communicate with them at all times, and also with you, Lord. So we're open to you, and we ask, Lord, that you would do that in our lives. In the name of Jesus, and we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. He is good, right? He's a good God, and he wants us to succeed. And he's all about celebrating. And anyone who gives their life to him, who ever gets saved, there's a celebration that happens in heaven, right? 
Praise God. He's good. Uh, let me just speak a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make a sh face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may you walk in the victory of Jesus every day of your life. Amen. Amen.